You, God, are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my singing lips will glorify you. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. Would you stand, please, as we sing?
things he hath done. Would you take a few minutes to greet each other? All right, uh, because of the first service, I made people stand too long. You may be seated. <laughs> um, my name is Reed Burnick. I'm the pastor to young adults here at First Baptist Church of Alexandria, and I wish it was under better circumstances that I was invited to be here, but truthfully, we have so much to be thankful for. Um, the Davidsons are, are seated over here, Don's family, but Don is doing really well. He's recovering. Thankfully, he's resting, which I think is good for him. Um, but due to Audrey's quick thinking and God's providence, he is safe and well. And um, this week, despite the shuffling cast of characters you might see on the stage this morning, we have a lot to praise God for in, um, in healing him and in helping him. So um, one of my duties today as assigned is to perform my first ever baby dedication. But thankfully, I have the honor and privilege of inviting some dear friends on stage right now. This is Ross and Amy Grace Donahue, and this is their little boy, John Willard Donahue. <laughs> so I want to do several things today. The big thing that I want you to do is introduce you to this lovely face. Hi. <laughs> um, but also introduce you to this family that has already served us in a variety of ways, and hopefully you know them. If you haven't, then you should, because they are worth knowing. Um, and then I also want to invite them before this congregation to make a commitment about how they plan to raise John in a Christian home and lead him to Jesus. Because here at First Baptist, and in our tradition, we believe that being born even to really, really great parents isn't enough to save you. That it will be up to John It'll be up to Holy Spirit working in John to make that profession someday. And so we want to ask them to make that commitment and then pray for John accordingly. And then I also want to ask all of you in a few moments, if you would be a part of the Donahue's life as they seek to raise John in a Christian home. So that's the plan. Um, I'm going to ask some questions. Um, Ross and Amy Grace, today are you committing yourselves to raise John in a Christian home? And if so, say we are. Will you model for him what it means to live as Christ called us to live? Say, say, we will. We will. Will you seek to lead John towards Jesus in the hope that he'll make his own choice someday to profess faith in Christ as his Lord? If so, say, we will. We will. All right, Kim, they've chosen a life verse. Yes, you have. He's chosen Micah 6, 8. He has shown us, John, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. All right, would it be possible for me to hold him? Oh, hi, little guy. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, you have given this family so much potential and you have blessed them so generously in this little guy. Lord, we don't know the plans that you have for him, but we know that they are plans for his good and for his flourishing. We know that they're plans for all of us, that he would bless the world um, in his connection with you. And so we ask that you'd empower this family to make every decision they can to point him to you in every circumstance. Lord, and I pray for us as a congregation that we would be with them and strengthen them for that task, that we would take great care as we lead him in Bible study over the years, Lord, and as everything about this place comes to impact him and his view of the world. We love you and we trust you to do this work in him, not for, not for our fame and our glory, but for yours. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Do I have to give him up? <laughs>
We continue in worship by singing Worthy of Worship. Would you stand, please? Worthy of worship, worthy of praise.
start again And I don't need to keep on hiding I'm fully known And loved by you You won't let go, no No matter what I do And it's not one or the other It's our truth and ridiculous grace To be known, fully known Loved by you, I'm fully known and loved by you. It's so like you to keep pursuing. It's so like me to go astray. But you got my heart with your truth, the kind of love that's bulletproof. And I surrender to your kindness, oh, 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 I'm fully known And loved by you, you won't let go, no No matter what I do And it's not one or the other It's our truth and ridiculous grace to be known Fully known and loved by you I'm fully known and loved by you How real, how wide, how rich, how high is your heart I cannot find the reason why you'd give me so much How real, how wide, how rich, how high is your heart I cannot find the reason why you'd give me so much I'm fully known and loved by you You won't let go, no, you won't let go No matter what I do And it's not one or the other It's hard truth and ridiculous grace To be known, fully known And loved by you I'm fully known by you it's so unusual it's frightening i'm fully known and loved by you Talking about our faith is hard, isn't it? In fact, explaining any spiritual thing can be kind of a challenge. Knowing what words to say, knowing what words best describe our experiences with God, knowing whether what we're saying is correct, or if we're inadvertently professing some obscure ancient heresy, it can be a really intimidating thing for us to do in any context. And some of that pressure is cultural. I think, because like any community, there's a kind of shared jargon in the church world, such that when someone comes to faith, they have to learn our language. Children have to do that. John Willard will have to do that someday. Christians of any type or age, as they come to know Jesus, typically have to do that or they're going to stick out like a sore thumb. At one point in seminary, someone once told us, that that's actually the main reason the church invests in professional clergy. So that when people are required to give voice to their faith, particularly in stressful situations, like a wedding or a funeral, or even a baby dedication, like we just witnessed, then someone will be there who's trained. Not just to know what's true, but to communicate in ways that make sense. And yet all of us, not just pastors, not just myself, are asked by Jesus to be his witnesses and to speak about and profess our faith before our neighbors. And from my perspective, that job has actually only gotten harder with time because on top of all that normal anxiety that we feel about talking about spiritual things, society's become, at least on the surface, far less hospitable. It's not that the gospel's lost a coherence or that it can't make sense of the new world that you and I find ourselves in, but I think, it's, I think it's more that the basic human problems that the gospel identifies and then confronts just don't seem as relevant 
to postmodern people as they did 50 years ago, or maybe even 15 years ago. In middle school and high school, I went to church every Tuesday night, as any aspiring pastor would, for something called faith evangelism. Some of you know exactly what this is. For the first hour, I was trained to share my faith using the simple acronym, which, where each letter advanced you through certain scriptural passages, sort of a, a five easy steps to find Jesus. And then the second hour, we all pile in each other's cars and go knock on doors. We asked complete strangers what they thought might happen to them if they died in a car accident that night, even though it was 8.30 and they were at home ready to go to bed. We asked them where they thought they would go. And some of those people that we visited stuck it out through to the end, all the way through the sinner's prayer, and others chased us out of their homes, yelling at us to leave them alone. But those memories seem so odd to me now. That strategy feels so naive. Very few people today seem to have any opinion about what happens to them when they die. Very few people believe in absolute or objective spiritual realities anymore. And far fewer people tolerate being proselytized in their living rooms by a couple of strange 16-year-olds. But for many, many people, especially for young people, the message of the gospel no longer feels like a helpful answer to our deepest questions and longings. It feels like a solution in search of a problem. And that's what I want to talk about this morning, putting it into words. How can you and I talk about our spiritual lives and spiritual things and God's work in us and, and the gospel with, with integrity and with honesty, particularly in a time when, like I said, so many people around us don't even know what they need and then we tragically don't even know how to break it to them. It's in that context I'd like to read our psalm for this morning. If you remember, Pastor Don's been guiding us through a sizzling summer in the psalms. Uh, sizzling, you might say. And in keeping with that journey, I'd like to read Psalm 107 together. We're going to read the whole thing because if we can't read a whole psalm in church, then what are we doing? But we're going to read it all. It's 43 verses long. I promise that I will read as quickly and as dynamically as I can muster. But please follow along if you can. Also, in your app this week, this is a Reed Burnick FBCA first. I have supplied notes to the appropriate people so that you can follow along with the message as well. And I encourage you to do that. Psalm 107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he's redeemed from the hand of the adversary and gathered from the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desert region. They didn't find a way to an inhabited city. They were hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within him. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them out of their distresses. He led them also by a straight way to go to an inhabited city. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. For he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. There were those who dwelt in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in misery and chains because they'd rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he humbled their heart with labor. They stumbled and there was none to help. Then... They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their bands apart. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. For he has shattered the gates of bronze and cut bars of iron asunder. Fools, because of their rebellious way and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all kinds of food. And they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word, and he healed them, and he delivered from them from their destructions. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them also offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell them of his works with joyful singing. 
Now those who go down to the sea in ships who do business on great waters, they have seen the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he spoke and raised up a stormy wind which lifted up the waves out of the sea. They rose up to the heavens and then they went down to the depths and their soul melted away in their trouble. And he brought them out of their distresses. He caused the storm to be still so that the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they were quiet. So he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them extol him also in the congregation of the people and praise him at the seat of the elders. He changes rivers into a wilderness and springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salt waste because of the wickedness of those who dwell in it. He changes a wilderness into a pool of water and a dry land into springs of water and there he makes the hungry to dwell so that they may establish an inhabited city and sow fields and plant vineyards and gather a fruitful harvest. Also he blesses them and they multiply greatly and he does not let their cattle decrease. When they're diminished and bowed down through oppression, misery and sorrow, he pours contempt upon princes and makes them wander in a pathless waste. But he sets the needy securely on high away from affliction and makes his families like a flock. The upright see it and are glad, but all unrighteousness shuts its mouth. Who is wise? Let him give heed to these things and consider the, this is one of my favorite new terms in the Bible, the loving kindnesses of the Lord. Okay, so here's our plan for this morning. I'd like to focus on four helpful insights that this psalm gives us in relation to articulating the gospel, in relation to putting our spiritual lives into words. And they are, focus on what you know, use analogies, be creative and persistent, and finally, lift up clear biblical claims. So first up, focus on what you know. That was a long passage. I appreciate all of your patience. I didn't hear any sighing, which was great. But I needed to read it because without reading the whole thing, we would lose this context. So if you notice, there was a, there was a bit of an intro at the start. And then the bulk of the psalm, verses 4 through 32, is comprised of these four main chunks. Each of which is a different kind of story. So the first talks about being lost in a desert and being hungry and thirsty. The second talks about being imprisoned in a jail. The third, which is probably the trickiest to pin down into a particular thing, seems to be talking about someone who's sick. And then the fourth, the final message, has this vivid story of sailors who are caught out in a storm on the high sea. And it's that first story that we need to focus on first because it does something slightly different than the other three. The subjects of those other stories seem to be kind of conjured out of thin air. If you look at the way they start and the pronouns, maybe even imagined as characters and hypothetical scenarios. But the start of the first story is connected clearly with the intro. So if you go back to verse 2, the psalmist writes, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he's redeemed from the hand of the adversary and gathered from the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and the south. And then verse 4, They wandered in the wilderness in the desert region. Meaning it was the people they, that God gathered that are doing the wandering in the desert. And that tie-in to the introduction doesn't seem to happen again and again, but only here. So what's going on? Well, we can't be absolutely positive, but it seems likely, given what we see here and other places in the psalm, that this is a psalm written around the time that the Israelites are returning to Jerusalem from exile. Last week... When Brian talked about Hosea, or excuse me, Haggai, he talked about the destruction of the temple and the Jews returning back to the temple mount and the question as to when to rebuild the temple and how to rebuild it. That's probably the historical background at play here, especially when the psalmist talks about this gathering from the lands, from the four corners of the earth. He's talking about the diaspora of the Jewish people out into exile amongst their conquerors. Which means that this first story, unlike the others, has an interesting promise because it could be testimonial. 
We know that Israel entered captivity. We know they lived in Babylon for 70 years. And we know that God allowed them and his mercy to return after that period of time. But what we don't often think about is how perilous of a journey that would have been for them to return back to Jerusalem from wherever they were. And we see maybe some glimpse of that here in verses 4 through 9. They searched for an inhabited city. They're hungry and thirsty. Not just that, but they, their soul fainted within them, it says. They didn't know what they would find when they arrived. They didn't know what to expect around every corner. And yet God, in his loving kindness, just as he'll do in the other stories, but in very different ways, God delivers them out of their distresses and he satisfies their needs. I think this is our baseline story in the psalm. It's the psalmist relaying firsthand this experience of making that pilgrimage. It's a testimony and one that I think introduces the main thrust of this psalm, that God saves and he satisfies his people. But it's unique here at the start because it's communicated through this this personal experience of wandering in a desert. And I think you and I would do well to remember that and to follow that example. Whenever we have the opportunity to share the gospel or to talk about what God has done in our lives, we don't have to worry about saying everything there is to say. We should focus first on putting our own experiences into words, whatever they are, whether that's a radical conversion from drug addiction or whether that's coming up, for, coming up front when you're six years old. Or better yet, you can phrase it like this. We're only commissioned to share what we've received. We need to remember evangelism doesn't have to look like making a systematic theologian out of your cashier at Target. It doesn't have to look like answering every question your coworker throws at you. Because the only thing that Jesus asks us to relay is the gospel that he's given us as it's affected the life that he's given us. That's what we're responsible for. We only have to say what we know. That's it. Now some of you are systematic theologians because I've been in Bible studies with some of you. I know that you think carefully and well about large issues. Some of you have good answers to brutally hard questions. And I encourage you to share those things because those are goods that God has given you. Those, that that falls within this formula of being commissioned to relay what you've been given. But we shouldn't overburden ourselves by thinking we have to sell our friends on something that we ourselves don't yet understand. In whatever manner the gospel has made an impact on your life, that's the substance of your witness and nothing else. So we have to start there. And there's more because we should also use analogies as I've said, these other stories feel more figurative than testimonial. It's all poetry. That, that much is obvious. Psalm 107 was a song. It was probably written to be sung in the courts of the temple, maybe even the newly rebuilt temple after the Jews have returned and constructed it afresh. But whereas the desert story feels like this firsthand account, these others feel more like analogies. And by analogy, all I mean to say is a kind of semantic tool, something that helps us to communicate. Analogies can be anything from similes and metaphors to allegories. All of those devices are meant to better describe something by placing it in relation to something else, whether that's using words like like or as in similes, right, or just equating them as in metaphors. Hopefully this is coming back to you in elementary school grammar or even speaking figuratively, right? All of that is analogical language. And I think that's what's at work here in these other stories, and it's one of the most important elements of this psalm. The psalmist has already told us what God has done in bringing the Israelites back to Jerusalem. He's guided them for hundreds of miles to reach their home. But now, alongside that historical account, we're offered these other narratives that paint pictures of what that salvation actually was like. We're given analogies to fill out and to deepen our understanding of how the experience of God's grace feels. What does it feel like? It's like being broken out of prison, the psalmist says. It's like being healed from a disease. It's like miraculously being spared as you're out on the water in a storm. 
I'm convinced that we need to use analogies to talk about the gospel because we have to. And that's because I think God is simply too big and the gospel is too grand for human language to fully wrap its arms around. We need metaphor. We need analogy if we stand any chance at all of approximating God's work in us and all that the gospel has accomplished on our behalf, which is an uncomfortable reality for some. Because as I said at the beginning, that's not really how our world works today. We like bullet points and we like precise language and we like factoids and snapshots and tweets. Our patience for long form artistic analogy to describe a spiritual reality is pretty low right now. It's running pretty thin. And even for those of us who are like it, who like it, even for those of us who appreciate literature and metaphor, don't often think about those things as being able to convey those truths better than those other form factors do. But not everything worth saying or knowing can be summed up as history or math or science. Figurative language, narrative, metaphor, these are invaluable tools to teach us things that matter. And I think there's precedent for it. So take the song Amazing Grace. When John Newton wrote those words, he wasn't telling us about a time he was physically or literally lost. He'd never been blind. He wasn't trying to argue that grace is something that we can actually hear if we just pay close attention that our ears will actually hear a sweet sound. And yet the words that he uses are helpful, right? Because they're helpful in capturing something fundamental, both about Newton's experience with God, but then also because of the way the song has resonated in the church, also our own experience with God. And when he uses those expressions, I think he's building even more fundamentally on something that we see in Scripture, particularly in the Old Testament, because the Bible is full of, of analogical language, turns of phrase, terminology that's intended to deepen our understanding of God. God is likened to a mother bear in Hosea chapter 13. He's likened to a mother eagle in Deuteronomy 32. And then he's likened, my favorite, to a mother chicken in Matthew 23. And Jesus is the one who coins the mother chicken analogy, right? Now, God isn't all of these things at once. He isn't isn't literally a bear, a chicken, and an eagle. He is like these things, and these images help describe him to us. Perhaps even more fundamentally, salvation in Scripture, even in those passages that we take to be clear and normative expressions about what the gospel is at its most elemental level, even if you look at those, you find analogical language. What is salvation? Salvation. It's reconciliation. It's redemption. It's justification. It's expiation. It's election. All of these are concepts that the New Testament writers borrow from different places in order to what? In order to describe what salvation really is. It's like making peace with your enemy. It's like being bought. It's like being acquitted at a trial. I could go further, but let me stop there because, and and just say this, relaying the gospel, even in the Bible, involves the use of this analogical way of thinking. And so when you and I attempt to give expression to what God has done in us and through us, through his son, we should use them too. And by doing that, we'll be creative and perhaps we'll even need to be persistently creative, which can be deeply uncomfortable, I know. We need to imagine new ways of putting the gospel into words. And that kind of creativity isn't something that's often discussed here in a church, more or less, or, or even commended. And for good reasons. The root cause probably has to do with this impulse in the church to guard itself from error and to hand down its message with as little confusion or change as possible. And so we're not going to encourage creative expression of the gospel. We want to make sure that we guard this precious pearl of a thing. And that's a na- noble impulse, but too often it can, be, it can start to justify a very static, legalistic way of talking. It chokes out the Christian artists 
among us. It leaves very little room for good Christian art, for self-expression of any kind. It was just a few years ago, if you can remember, that churches were arguing about whether or not God had a sloppy wet kiss or an unforeseen kiss. Do you remember that? More recently, we've debated whether it's appropriate to sing about God's love as reckless or not. And it's in worship, actually, mostly, that this, tends to, that this tends to happen, that these conundrums are put upon us. Because at a very practical level, worship is, is often a creative work of a human being, right? Behind these songs are flesh and blood people who have to weigh the meanings and connotations of the words that they use. And so these questions are always there. What words are useful for describing what God has done? What words are permitted Are there words that I can use that tie in to a legitimized tradition of Christianity? Words that have been sanctioned by the the appropriate people? Or is there any room for creative expression? Can we say new things? Can we sing a new song? Or should we always just fall back to this basic kind of precedent? Well, no surprise here. But I think that Psalm 107 is this good answer to some of those questions. Not only does the psalmist give us these colorful, vivid descriptions of God's grace at work in these various, possibly hypothetical situations, but they're clearly imaginative. The last one, and this is is my proof of the fact that they are imaginative, the last one comes about uh, this this storm on the sea is, is so foreign to Israelite culture. Israel was not a seafaring people. Um, they, were, they were skittish of water. They often didn't set sail on the Mediterranean to see what would happen, mostly because of their theology. In Genesis, how does God create? He hovers over this endless ocean, and he beckons creation out of the deep. He floats over the, the waters, this chaos. And so water in the Israelite consciousness is this destructive, chaotic, pre-created formless stuff why would you want to sail on it and so you don't find many Jews at that time who were willing to set sail outside of uh, outside of eyeshot of land you'd be hard pressed to do that new times call for new approaches and new words though and that's why the psalmist here makes use of that analogy because it says something true about his experience with God important gospel truths call for creative and persistent tellings and retellings. Psalm 107 could have just stuck with the literal history. It would have been a lot shorter for all of us, right, to to sit through. But instead, it's buttressed by all these metaphorical examples. Why? In order to better describe it, to better bear witness to the full thing. I say persistently because this psalm doesn't just give us a single analogy. It isn't the wandering in the desert and then the seafaring analogy. You know, there's, there's four different versions of how God saves his people, much like the four gospels that we have in our New Testament. And I would argue for much the same reason. Why? Because they each have something unique to contribute. They each has something new to share about the grace and the mercy of God. Being without God is like being hungry in a desert. It's like being trapped in a dungeon. It's like being scared for your life as your boat takes on water. Now, not all of us are poets and writers and artists. But to the extent that all of us are these unique individuals with our own stories and whose the gospel has impacted us in these unique ways, I think that sharing that gospel should always be fundamentally a creative act. Something that is ours. The last thing I'd like to consider is lifting up clear biblical claims. And some of you are breathing a sigh of relief at this point because all this talk about analogy and art and creativeness, creativity, that just makes some of us kind of squeamish, I know. But I mention this last because for all of the liberating encouragement that this psalm gives us to speak freely, there are some really basic reminders here that we have to bear in mind. In other words, we shouldn't be so overburdened with the necessity of creativity that we neglect basic, fundamental biblical claims. And there are several of those repeated here in Psalm 107, almost like choruses in a song. 
because they're probably choruses in a song. All four sections, excuse me, all the first three sections include the subjects calling on the Lord. And all four very intentionally talk about God delivering them because of his loving kindness. The subjects in each scenario are asked to give thanks to the Lord for his wonders to the sons of men. That could be a liturgical part of of the way that this song was used, right? Groups of people would come to the temple and this song was sung as an encouragement to give thanks, literally, to God in, in his presence there at the temple. Interestingly, in two of the four, not in the testimonial or in the seafaring one at the end, the subjects find themselves in these predicaments because of something that they've done, because of their failings. They're in jail because they've spurned the counsel of the Most High, it says in verse 11. And as it says in verse 17, the people who are sick are afflicted because of their iniquities. But the Israelites in the desert are in need for a different reason, right? They're, they're in need because they're in a desert. And there's no place to go buy food or to get water. And the people on the high seas are in need. Why? Because it's the ocean and the ocean is a terrifying place. But in all those situations, there are, there are echoes of the reasons why God's grace needs to come and save us. And in all of them, they are dependent. And God delivers them. That's what seems to matter the most. The psalmist repeats these claims over and over again because in each case, I think they're echoes of salvation's basic shape. It's imperative that we call on God when we're in need. That's not negotiable. And the psalmist interjects that fact in every version of the story. And if there's any doubt, who delivers? You know, did the people in jail find a skeleton key? Did the people on the ocean just get lucky? No. In none of those scenarios is that the case. It's God who delivers. He does it, too, because he loves us. Sometimes he saves us from the things that we do to ourselves. And other times he saves us from situations over which there is no observable cause. That he is the only reason that the ocean does what it does. And no matter what, it's right, therefore, that we thank him for that grace. What does it look like for you and I to weave those claims into our own articulations of the gospel as we put it into words? And should it always look like quoting scripture? Well, sometimes I think it should. Sometimes that can be helpful because there's power in the words of scripture And if we're looking for a precedent or a sanction, then we should look no further for for divine sanction than the biblical text. So absolutely, quote scripture, but more often than not, I think it looks like us doing the hard, introspective work of describing these things in our own words. The world desperately needs thoughtful Christians who can move through and past that modern agnosticism about spiritual things and place their finger on fundamental issues about what it means to be human, about morality, about sin, about forgiveness, and, and more likely in postmodern people about purpose and about meaning. Sometimes that'll look more liturgical, more churchy. Sometimes that'll feel more like a Psalm 107 where you recite something that you've been given or received, but other times it won't. It'll look personal, maybe imperfect, but it'll always be sincere. Let me conclude by going back to the beginning. As I said before, I feel worlds away from those Tuesday night experiences. I have doubts about the kind of help I was able to provide those people that I spoke with, I have vivid memories thinking about how easy and straightforward this gospel must be if two people who've never met before can affect eternal consequences by spending five minutes out in a driveway talking through an acronym. How simple this thing must be. The gospel doesn't always feel quite so uncomplicated to me anymore. I look back and I wonder about my sincerity about the sincerity of those professions of faith that we reported in the fellowship hall when we came back to the church that evening and people clapped. And some of that uneasiness won't ever go away. I won't know. I 
can't know. And language will never be foolproof. Strategies, however nuanced they are, however creative, they won't ever be airtight. We'll get this wrong. We'll probably get it wrong often. But what I do know is this. If there's any reason that evangelism doesn't quite seem to fit in our current world, then it's not because the gospel has lost its power. It's because we've forgotten about and lost confidence in these basic truths about communicating our faith. So let's reclaim them together. Let's share what we know and not what we don't know. No matter how vulnerable that leaves our testimony, no matter how open-ended that might make our spiritual conversation or our witness, let's be creative in our sharing and use analogies and metaphors to address the strangeness about our testimony, the way that spiritual things don't seem to fit in our world, and yet they're true and they're real. Let's be persistent in that creativity and use all that God has given us to further this commission in our lives. If you are smart and knowledgeable about such a thing, pass that on. If you're not, don't worry about it. And as we do these things, let's not neglect the basic truths behind our faith in Jesus, that he delivered us. This, this salvation shape evident in all these stories that he's saved us from the power of sin in the world and that he's worthy of all of our thanksgiving would you pray with me father we love you and we trust you to give us all that we need and i pray that these words from psalm 107 would be an encouragement to us that as we try and figure out how to share the good news with people that we know that Psalm 107 would be a reminder that you're with us, that you can guide us, Lord, and that we can find sincere, honest ways of discussing our faith, even in today's world. We love you, and we ask all this in your son's name. Amen. We sing a prayer together. Would you stand? Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like you. You Would you please be seated? Kim has some wonderful announcements. For Hello, us. friends. Summer is flying by, and the fall will be here soon with new opportunities for spiritual growth and connecting with one another. Ladies, registration is open now for the North Star Women's Fresh Grounded Faith Conference with Jennifer Rothschild and Laura Story, which will be held on September 11th in Woodbridge. A limited number of tickets are available at a reduced price through the First Baptist Women's Ministry. So go to the website to learn more and to reserve a ticket for yourself and maybe also for a friend. I look forward to seeing you there. Men, there's something coming up for you too. 
Registration is now open for the men's retreat taking place at the Claggett Center in Adamstown, Maryland on November 5th to 7th. Join your brothers in Christ for a weekend of discipleship, fellowship, and fun. Sign up now and put it on your calendar. But summer is not over yet. The next Young Adult Forum is coming up on August 7th. Join Pastor Reed as he leads discussion on the question, is it appropriate for Christians to promote their values through legislation? You won't want to miss it. You can register on the website. The last Pastors in the Park will be held on August 8th at Lee District Park. If you haven't been to one yet, join us for a relaxing evening of conversation. There's no agenda. Bring a chair, some food if you want, and we'll sit and chat with one another. Just come to the park and look for the balloons. God blessed us with a wonderful week at in-person Destination Dig Vacation Bible School, but VBS is not over. Virtual Vacation Bible School is available throughout the summer, so sign up today, then gather at home, in your backyard with friends, or bring VBS along with you as you travel. This summer, our VBS motto is, Seek Truth, Find Jesus. No matter where we are or whatever situation we find ourselves in, God is there and his promises are true. As we go, may we seek him and his way with all of our hearts.